All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danny Mariscal, and I'm a customer success manager at Zoom Video Communications. I'm primarily focused on our wonderful EDU space. So my job is to educate those customers on how to utilize their services and ensure that they're 150% happy. Today, I'm excited to bring you a wonderful panel to discuss you know, the technology and equipment that drives engagement across classrooms and external professionals, as well as like-minded individuals. You know, before we actually step into introductions, though, I'd like to actually take a poll of the room. First question for you guys is, who here is representing the K through 12 space by show of hands? Gotcha. All right, and then higher ed, university level? Oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and then lastly, anybody who's not education oriented attending today? Perfect, there's still a lot of value for, here, uh, for you as well. Cool, so I'd like to um, ask the panelists you know, what their backgrounds are, where they're coming from, and one very important question, if one of you could be any animal, which animal would you choose? Um, so if you want to go ahead and step up, either Kale or Brad. I'll go ahead. Uh, I'm Kale Kendrzewski. I come from the University of Notre Dame. I work for the teaching and learning team uh, at the university. And my role is an academic technology professional, so I'm working in the LMS as well as with Zoom for Education and everything in between on the software side. Uh, and if I could be any animal, I think I'm going to go with an eagle just because I feel like I would like to fly and see things from a distance, but be able to zoom in when I need to. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brad Cray. I'm with California State Parks. I work in our interpretation and education division, which is the, the outreach branch of California State Parks. We do a lot of the, uh, the, the traditional place-based interpretive programs, your campfire programs, junior rangers, all the hikes, tours, and walks. Uh, but more recently, in about 15 years ago, we decided to start doing innovative outreach so that we could reach audiences that were not coming to California State Parks. And so that's why we're here today. I'm happy to talk with you about that. Uh, if I could be any animal, uh, you asked us this earlier in the week. And I'm still going to go with, I treat my pugs really well. <laughs> so I'm going to go with pugs. And those of you who don't like pugs can just... <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Jackie Benitez. I'm coming from the California Academy of Sciences, which is a natural history museum, a planetarium, and a uh, living science museum uh, under one green living roof just up the road in San Francisco. And we developed a uh, distance learning program uh, about five years ago that helped connect classrooms to the academy that wouldn't be able to actually get to the physical building itself. And so I am our education specialist there uh, for our distance learning program. Gotcha. I love the answer for the pug because we tend to treat our dogs better in the Bay Area than other <laughs> human beings, so <laughs> I definitely can relate to that. Um, you took my answer. If I had to be an animal, I'd definitely be an eagle or a bird, right? Just travel around the world and get myself out there. So my first question would be, what problem did Zoom solve for you, and how did you set to accomplish those goals? I'd like to actually direct that to Brad. Sure. So as I mentioned, California State Parks has been around actually since 1864. There's a long history of California State Parks as an educational entity for the students of California. Uh, if you grew up here, you may have actually visited one as a part of your education experience. Um, but we saw about 20 years ago a trend in education coming less and less to parks. Um, for many reasons that you may be aware of, you know, time constraints in classrooms, obviously budgets, but also the growing K-12 education, um, uh, the amount of students in K-12 education. So um, some very forward-thinking people in, in state government, believe it or not, decided that they could use technology to actually bring parks into classrooms. And we settled on uh, using live video conferencing to um, meet the needs of K-12 education to provide academic uh, content for students in the classroom without actually leaving the classroom. And we say that, but I also say we want students still to come. So it's also an introduction to state parks, and it's a way for them to get information and maybe some inspiration to go home and ask their parents for a visit. So we spent um, quite a few years uh, piloting um, distance learning programs. Uh, we, uh, I manage a program called PORTS, and that's Parks Online Resources for Teachers and Students. 
And so what we do now is we have about 20 different state parks here in California. That's a small fraction, believe it or not, of the California state park system. But they offer um, live video conferences from one interpretive ranger into one class period at a time. And so we have um, topics ranging from uh, science to history, um, you know, from Gold Rush era Native, Native Americans to uh, the forests, the oceans, and the deserts, um, where we're actually speaking live and engaging in conversation with students, sometimes hundreds of miles away, in that academic content, and again, to inspire and hopefully invite them for a visit in the long term. Gotcha. That's, that's really amazing. I remember past conversation, you said you actually provide the service for free, right? Yeah. Sorry. So we, we overlooked that. Um, <laughs> so we do this. Uh, it's always been a completely free program. Again, uh, we, we do not want uh, K-12 education to have any barrier to California state parks. And of course, economics is a barrier as well as geographic barriers. Um, so we do it all for free. And uh, so we partner with great companies, including Zoom, to, uh, to help us do those services for free for K-12 education. Gotcha. That's, uh, that's really great to hear. And if you don't mind, uh, Jackie, stepping mm -hmm. up to the plate and kind of discussing what you guys do at Cal Academy of Sciences, would be great. Yeah, so for, um, we're in a similar boat as uh, California State Parks, where we um, started off um, wanting students who didn't get the opportunity, whether it was financial barrier, whether it was location barrier, or even a mobility barrier of not actually being able to come to the academy itself. And so uh, it became a uh, project of love, meaning we didn't really have the uh, funds to actually get the program um, up and running. So uh, we started off with a very uh, minimal uh, setup, and it allows us to interact individually with uh, classrooms, uh, but we've branched out into the streaming world, the live streaming world, of, and being able to bring in um, multiple classrooms all at once. So, for example, uh, in, later in October, we're going to have our Spooktacular Skulls program, and we are estimating that we're going to be able to reach about um, 100 classrooms per session, um, when normally those classrooms would not be able to maybe see physical skulls or a wide, wide ver uh, variety of skulls. Uh, we get the opportunity through Zoom webinar um, that allows us to be able to connect with multiple classrooms all at once. And you're able to just create these authentic experiences, right, all across the globe, out in the field, wherever you're at. Um, there's actually something that Kale mentioned uh, in terms of a more stationed experience there at Notre Dame. It's called the Global Classroom Project. Do you mind expanding upon what's happening there at Notre Dame? Yeah, so at Notre Dame, we are still largely a traditional school of face-to-face, -face, but we, are, we do have a data science program, and um, over 75% of students travel abroad during their studies at Notre Dame. So we are growing in the online sense, but one of the issues we were trying to face is trying to get in instructors to want to teach online, to be excited about not losing that face-to-face -face experience. So the goal of the Global Classroom, and we ran the pilot this past summer of it, was to create a classroom that felt familiar to um, instructors so that they could walk in and feel a sense of presence with the students um, and also not have to necessarily learn um, how to use a special room or anything like that. So we tried to take the technology burden off of them as much as we could so they could walk in, teach standing, teach moving with their hands, um, and also be able to see all the students at the same time. So that's where um, we looked at other universities. Uh, Harvard has a similar setup that was extremely fancy with 60 plus cameras and an entire studio, but we wanted to scale that down and make it so that it um, not only worked well for us, but also you know, reduced the cost of it to be manageable for the future. That's great, and um, that face-to-face, -face, back in my day at school, I'm not that old, it's, <laughs> things have changed with technology, so that's great that you're able to provide that. Um, as far as behind the scenes and providing the technology or equipping yourself to accommodate these use cases, Jackie, do you want to dive in what you're doing at Cal Academy in that yeah. respect? Sure. Um, so we actually do uh, one of the simplest uh, setups where it's literally a um, 
laptop on a mobile cart, um, one extra monitor so I can be able to see uh, what it is I'm presenting, whether it's a PowerPoint presentation um, or I might be able to bring up um, our live web cameras into our Penguin exhibit. Um, and we are able to uh, just use Zoom uh, and be able to connect that way. So we've been able to bring in our macaws, as you can see. Um, they were very loud um, that day. And uh, they were still troopers. We had an extra camera that uh, day, which is kind of unusual for us. Um, but they uh, showed off their beautiful colors to uh, thousands of kindergartners at that point. Um, and we just have a simple Logitech uh, web camera as well as I use um, a headset. Um, so though that way I just uh, am directly using that microphone. Um, but most importantly, I actually have um, the speaker going into my ear. Uh, one of the things that we have found is that uh, sometimes teachers are using laptop computers um, with their microphones and it can be difficult to be able to pick up student voices through that. And so to have it directly into my ear, um, it allows me to understand the students a little bit better. Awesome. Go ahead, Brad. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, we do this from a variety of different locations around California State Parks and some of the pictures you can see where we do programs from. Um, we first started about 15 years ago with a, a, a green screen program. Um, and that was because we wanted to show students the elephant seals at Anga Nuevo Island which is a quarter of a mile out to sea near Half Moon Bay. Um, it's a great story of, of evolution and adaptations and these giant marine mammals that come out onto the, to the beach to, to, to fight and mate and you know, have a you know, good old time on, the, on land and then go out to sea. Uh, so we thought that would be a great place to stick a camera and then peep, pipe it back to a, a green screen studio in Santa Cruz. Um, so, you know, in that, in that instance, uh, we've kind of evolved a little bit to uh, using Roland mixers and uh, some more high-tech equipment. However, all of our sites are one-person operations, so, and technically, they might be a non-technical ranger, so we try to make it as simple as possible. Um, and from our data that we found from teachers when we asked them, hey, how could we do this program better, they wanted us to be outside more and more. So they wanted to us to be actually in the historic building or out in the forest. So we just simply use a variety of um, mobile devices, either a, a, a phone, Surface Pro, iPad, um, and then some peripheral equipment like a Bluetooth headset or a gimbal stabilizer or just a tripod. And we bring students right out into the environment. So um, we try to keep it as simple as possible, um, you know, purchasing technology equipment in a state government is actually not very easy. Um, so we do what we can with off-the-shelf equipment and try to keep it non-professional uh, grade so that we can just kind of keep doing stuff. No, it definitely sounds like you're doing a lot with just a little bit of devices and taking an autonomous approach, right? Just going out in the field, using you know cell towers, and yep. really the adaptability of the product is able to like to do this kind of stuff. Inversely speaking, Kale, I know you guys have a more sophisticated setup in terms of what you're trying to accomplish with the um, Global Classroom project. Do you mind expanding on that? Yeah, so our project's a little different in the sense of we tried to hardwire everything we possibly could. <laughs> uh, so the setup that we used, and this was, again, a pilot, so pretty much everything we did was on wheels uh, for this. And uh, so the main thing that the instructors have is a Surface Studio. Um, we did have a spare HDMI where they could plug in a laptop if they want, but we used the Surface Studio as the main input device. They put their slides on it. They used it as a physical whiteboard. The Surface Studio is really cool because you can program the pencil button so it goes directly to the whiteboard. Um, and then uh, all of that is been then being fed into a Blackmagic switcher. So one thing we did that was a little different is we took all of the inputs and fed it into a Blackmagic so that a, we have a, someone we call a technical assistant, AKA student worker, who is trained to just run the room and do the switching for the instructor. So instead of the instructor having to you know, manage breakout rooms or um, know which camera to be on or whether they should be sharing their screen, we just have the student do that. They say the student would see the student or see the instructor going to the service studio and say switch to that. Um, and then up front you can see the screens. So we just had two large monitors uh, that one for the gallery view and then one that was flexible which ended up just being the we pulled out the zoom chat and put it on the left side and then put the active speaker on the right side of the screen 
Um, so one thing that the instructors really liked is being able to see the students at all times. Regardless if they're sharing something, they never lose track of like who, where the students are and being able to call on them if they didn't think they were paying attention. Uh, and then atop the, on the monitors, we used an auto tracking camera. Um, so that was, we tried out a few and we settled on uh, something called the huddle cam that just seemed to work well for our studio space because uh, we were working in a, a small area that it, a lot of the cameras weren't used to, but that ultimately worked really well. Again, we were trying to reduce the number of resources we needed, so this entire room was run by the one student for these class sessions. Um, and yeah, and then all that, uh, again, was fed into that black magic switcher and the student would just switch when they needed to. We could do picture in picture if they needed to as well. No, it looks amazing, actually. And in, in terms of all the equipment, the TA, all the knobs and uh, whistles in the back end, do you, do you notice that it may have helped in the retention department as in were students able to get that material more from a virtual perspective? Do you have any hard data as well as anecdotal evidence that all this equipment has helped with their learning? Yeah, so we uh, did survey all of the students that ran in the summer as well as the instructors. Um, all the instructors said they would teach in the room again. Uh, two of the instructors said they wouldn't teach online if the room weren't available. Uh, so, I mean, again, breaking down that barrier. Uh, and then for the students, they all, um, most of them said it was very similar to a face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, some back and forth on, on the data there. But ultimately what we really saw is that the instructors were able to walk in five minutes before class, we would hook up the lab and they were ready to teach, and they didn't have to spend any class time with the technology. They spent the entire, these were actually long classes, they ran an hour and a half to two hours, um, and they spent the entire time teaching that rather than having to spend uh, time, you know, figuring out which input to be on or how to switch screens or how to manage breakout rooms. So that was really great data as well. Uh, so it's great to hear. And, you know, we're, we're talking about all this equipment that you've, you've set up, configured, all the things that you've done in your journey. Um, how are guest lecturers or other classrooms connecting to you? I'd like to ask Jackie that question. Sure, so um, as I said, uh, we have connected uh, with one-to-one -one classrooms where we get to uh, go into the classroom itself. I can see the students, I can hear them, we can have a conversation. Um, it's almost as if I would have been in the physical classroom. Um, as well as we're able to connect um, with those live streaming events. Now when teachers are connecting via um, those one-to-one -one classrooms, usually we see teachers uh, using their uh, laptops, their built-in web cameras, um, as well as those built-in speakers. Um, as I alluded to earlier, it does have some uh, audio issues in the fact that those uh, speakers, or that microphone is actually uh, built into the laptop. It is only there to pick up sound that's about maybe a foot or two away from the microphone itself. So can you imagine about 25 <laughs> kindergartners, about five feet, if not more, away from the students? It becomes a little bit difficult to hear individual students. And um, as an educator, I want to hear each individual student because that's how I'm going to be able to interact with them, be able to hear what their curiosities are, and we can tailor the program that way for them. Um, and with those live streaming events, um, we do have the ability where they can just bring in their laptops, hook it up to their own speakers and their projector system, and then they are ready to go. So it's kind of the simplest and what I tend to encourage teachers to try out first um, because you don't need that microphone, you don't need that um, web camera. And Zoom's been able to um, allow us to get into even more classrooms than we used to be able to. Uh, we used to have a different um, provider um, that hosted our uh, video conferencing uh, programs. However, we saw that it was actually um, blocked by a lot of school districts. I have yet to see a school district that has blocked Zoom. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there's actually a vital use case you had discussed uh, with me in passing or in our prior conversations about audio being super critical in a specific use case. Yes, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Well. Um, what happens when uh, you can't actually have video on the students themselves? Um, we have had many cases where we've actually uh, went into juvenile halls, and that's a privacy issue where I'm not allowed to see the students who are actually physically there. I can still hear them, and that's how we're gonna be able to have that conversation. That's how we're gonna be able to explore sharks and rays and how they have different adaptations. 
uh, to be able to eat in their lagoons. Um, and I've had amazing conversations with those students and um, they've been able to point out things that I never noticed in the habitats that we had, um, that we were sharing that day. So um, that's why I believe audio is, is one of the most important things when we're uh, connecting with our students. Brad, um, what advice would you give others if they're trying to replicate what you've done in, in terms of that uh, going on sites, going in front of museums in, in the Capitol, out, yeah. out in the field, really just taking that free form approach? Yeah, I mean, uh, the advice I'd give is just keep it simple. Um, you know, face-to-face -face or video-first communications can provide really meaningful experiences. So you don't have to overcomplicate it. You know, sometimes nature speaks for itself. Sometimes the art speaks for itself. But really, um, when it comes down to it, it's, it's having, you know, somebody who's invested in delivering this kind of education or interpretation to an, a broader audience um, for, for a reason. So um, I think it's keep it simple, find the passionate people that are, that are invested in uh, bringing your resources out to, to our broader audience, because this is how learning can and should be happening, in my opinion, in K-12 classrooms now. We can, we can break out of the books, we can break out of the classroom walls to provide experiences. You know, California State Parks has lots of content experts ranging from archeologists to curators to, to law enforcement rangers to accounting specialists, believe it or not, right? Uh, you know, so why not give uh, access to, to students in K-12 system to these people? And how do you do that? You just try something, man. We, we never wrote a manual for this. We never, you know, there was no playbook for success. We just tried lots and lots of different things. Some of it failed and a lot of it succeeded and we see a great demand from education, which is also changing, um, you know, just like communications are. So to, to be able to provide, you know, these services simply, but to give a high quality product to K-12 education is what I'd say go for. Yeah, keeping it simple seems to be the primary goal for, you know, the, the AV techs out there and even for end users able to, you know, walk into a room specifically at Notre Dame and which does lead me to a next question. What challenges or, or lessons learned did you have uh, building that pilot out? Yeah, so we went through a lot of challenges. Uh, <laughs> uh, the big, biggest thing we learned is that the technical TA was extremely important to the su success of this project. And while we tried to th figure out, can we ultimately just have it so the instructor can run this room themselves, we decided that taking that burden off of them so that they can focus on teaching really reduced the cognitive load. But it put a lot of pressure on that technical TA. They had to, you know, it wasn't difficult, but there's a lot of things that they had to know how to do, let alone using the breakout rooms, what happens when you close the breakout rooms, how to readjust the windows, a lot of those little things. So one of the things we learned was they need to have a pre-flight checklist before every session that they physically have to print off and check off every single one to make sure that they run down the list and they um, don't get too comfortable. Uh, with the setup. I mean, ultimately it was a simple setup, but it, there was still a lot of cables and things that could, could potentially go wrong, especially when you are relying on anything that was wireless, like the wireless lavaliers or um, just all of the audio equipment in general. Um, so in general, it was just, uh, I mean, we, we created a lot of documentation in a short amount of time uh, to come up with the potential situations that could arise. Um, yeah, not everyone tends to follow scripts, scripts. so in those situations, um, were those teachers able to still run with what they have if they did encounter an issue or, or work around those types of things if the TA wasn't there, or has that situation ever <coughs> arisen? In, in yeah, way? so, uh, yeah, in one case, luckily the faculty that ran the pilot, uh, since we were kind of a bootstrap for the summer, uh, they were from the data science program, so they were a little bit on the tech savvier side. We did have an audio issue once with the lavaliers uh, not connecting to the receiver, and our, we were you know, fiddling around trying to figure out where, the, where it wasn't connecting, and the instructor just pulled out his phone, connected to the Zoom session on his phone, and starts talking to the students via his phone. So uh, luckily he was quicker thinking than we were <laughs> on the solution. No, that's, that's good, and uh, I, I love that you're able to really incorporate that learning aspect in the studio. I've never seen anything like that. I work with a lot of education customers. I'm seeing more Zoom rooms instead of, you know, this whole confidence monitor setup with that working TA. So that's, that's really amazing. Jackie, do you have any, you know, stories or, or special things that have impacted you personally throughout your journey? Um, with yeah, I, I, 
there's so many stories of connecting with different classrooms, um, being able to hear different perspectives, but one, one story has always stuck out to me is um, being able to connect to a um, remote location of uh, northern Canada, and um, this school was uh, mainly native uh, peoples that were um, up there. So they luckily had the infrastructure to be able to connect with me, um, and I was supposed to be doing a um, what we call our Planet Heroes program, talking about our food impact and how our um, how we choose our food is making an impact on our planet Earth. Um, about a week before the program, I was instructed by the person who had signed up that this was actually a um, food scarce area that they were not um, guaranteed a meal every um, all three meals every single day and I was scared I was looking I was trying to figure out okay how am I supposed to go into this classroom being somebody from the United States telling them that they need to watch what they eat because it's having an impact on our planet and I realized that you know what I have my script that's okay, I can fall back on that, but let's see what happens when I talk about what they do um, and how they eat. And that changed my perspective completely, that I can go into a program um, and have the flexibility that I can ask the students, you know what, I wanna hear your stories. I want you to tell me how do you eat, where do you get your food? And we got on a great conversation on fishing, on hunting. As a California native, hunting is not um, something that I do normally. Um, and so I got to hear their perspective and how they treat their food. Um, and I left learning more about food and what we should be doing with um, our food choices than I think they learned from me. But we had a great conversation and having the flexibility of being able to change um, my program um, through and using Zoom and um, the sharing of my screen, we were able to have that great conversation. I just love that you're able to connect with anybody in the world. I, I believe the motto of this conference is it just works. Mm -hmm. So I'm really happy that you're able to achieve all your goals with the, with the product. You know, at this point in time, I, I'd like to actually pivot to a, a 10 minute Q&A from the audience. If anybody has any questions, you know, I'd like you to state your name. Uh, ask it in one sentence you can clarify and who you're directing that question to. So if we can get a microphone, I'd love to. And I already see a couple hands back like there. Um, just give us a moment to get that microphone. I can talk loud. <laughs> <laughs> and we can repeat your question. People on the live stream. Uh, you talked about content and outreach. How do you market it? Do you have a place where you post your content being available to K-12 or higher ed? Uh, I'll start with that one. Um, so we do uh, market on our own website um, at calacademy.org um, under our educator page. Uh, another way that we're able to get our name out there um, that has helped us a lot is um, CILC.org. Um, they are a nonprofit that um, is a one-stop shop for anybody who's doing um, video conferencing um, out there for uh, K-12 um, and some higher ed as well. Um, and so that has been a huge uh, find for us to be able to get our content out there. Yeah, and we, um, so we, sorry. sorry? C-I-L-C dot org. And that's the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration. Actually, Brad was <laughs> the one you, that introduced me to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so we do lots of stuff like that, but, and we have a website. But really what, um, what we do is uh, we build a community of educators online that actually use the, our services and then they spread the word for us. Um, here in California, we work very closely with um, something called Q, which is Computer Using Educators, which is a, uh, the local affiliate of ISTE, which is the International Society for Technology and Education. You know, technology and education is a thing, right? And it has been for a long time. 
Um, so just, uh, you know, it's kind of pivoted a little bit to how to actually leverage technology to help deepen learning. So we work with partners like that, um, our website. Um, we also, uh, because we are platform agnostic, I probably shouldn't say this at the Zoom conference, but um, <laughs> we're supported by other organizations. And that's because we want to be able to provide any teacher anywhere, no matter what they are using, an opportunity to connect with us. We prefer Zoom, and we are proud to be powered by Zoom. But we we uh, we we remain platform agnostic. Is that good? Okay. <laughs> I think we got a question up front here, Ryan. Sorry to make you exercise here, run around. <laughs> uh, my name is Tommy John. I'm with Fusion Academy, and we're a uh, sixth or twelfth grade. Uh, middle and high school, and we're one-to-one -one education, and we're developing our virtual learning platform right now. And uh, I guess this question is uh, for Kyle, is it? Kale. Kale, sorry. Um, and I I'm wondering what subject matters you, you all have covered so far. The ones where we're running into some tricks are the lab sciences and uh, music production type things, and I'm wondering if, if you have any uh, experience with that or, or thoughts on it. Uh, just a little bit. Um, so the, over the summer, the program that ran was primarily data science. That's just the, we're running it over the summer and that's the online program that exists in the summer. So our, our um, pool was relatively limited, but we did have um, faculty, we had an open house where faculty came in to use the room and we did run some science experiments uh, through that. And one of the advantages of the way we had it designed is, is we, it's fairly off the shelf stuff as far as the Black Magic Switcher is, so anything that has an SDI plug-in can work. So we just you know, hooked a, an actual camera up and had the student walk around with the camera and was able to show what needed to be shown so we didn't have to rely on the auto-tracking camera at all times. Um, so uh, that, that worked pretty well. Uh, it just enabled some flexibility there. Is there any, um, any specific questions other than that or? Uh, it was, I guess it's probably more specific, more curriculum based uh, just because a lot, uh, lab sciences curriculum wise, uh, a lot of them are required to be in person and require, and so I was wondering if, if uh, Notre Dame had delved into virtual labs or anything like that more specifically. Uh, we haven't de dealt into virtual labs in that regard, at, le at least as part of the Global Classroom Project, no. Gotcha. Thanks. Right over here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Penny Pearson, and I'm with a um, ed tech training firm in within California. And all of your programs are great. Love Ports, been using it. I mean, it's wonderful. But one thing I haven't heard, and I'm wondering how you're addressing, or even if it's come up as an issue in your projects, is accessibility in terms of 508 compliance with your learners on the other side. Um, have you had to address that? Have you been looking at different types of equipment, uh, providing different services, or is it a case by case basis? Yeah, it's really case by case, and it's a moving target, as you know. Um, when we first started, yeah, there was a lot of, um, you know, what will you do if there's a deaf student in a classroom? Well, we, we would rely on that teacher to provide whatever service they were provide for that student anyway. So in terms of um, 508 compliance, yeah, it's kind of still a moving target, gray area. But because this is all live, um, so... You know, I love the fact that they have live captioning now. You know, we saw that and we're like, well, that's a big deal, right? Yeah. So, because um, cause that's a big part of 508 compliance is captioning videos on, online. Um, but because this is such a small section of content online and it's one-off and it's live, I don't even think there's been great regulations developed around it. So, you know, our team's, you know, kind of ethos is let's do whatever, whatever's right, whatever we can. So if we ever, we haven't seen an issue. We've been doing this for 15 years or so now through lots of different iterations of video conferencing. 